The Lord be with you. Welcome to our worship service today. This is the third Sunday of the Lenten season. It is great to see you all here. One of these Sundays, the temperature will warm up and we will come comfortably in sweaters and those kinds of things instead of our winter gear. But apparently that's not today. We do have a few announcements before we begin. March 26th is going to be our cultural potluck lunch following worship. So if you want to bring a dish that is uh, part, part of your, your heritage, heritage or even just your favorite, favorite dish, dish that'll, that'll be on the 26th. <laughs> bring, bring a story, story though. Bring a, how does this your, your favorite dish? dish? What, what culture, culture does this come, come from? from? All, All kinds of things. things. I'm Icelandic. We did, we did a lot, a lot of, violence of violence as a people, people so, so we didn't have a lot of time for recipes. recipes. But perhaps, perhaps you've got, got something, something else that you've got. The Ukrainian side of my heritage though, we have like all kinds of good things. So maybe we'll, maybe we'll tap the Ukrainian quarter or pastor rod for, for that Sunday. We'll leave the Icelandic side alone. Um, thank you to Gary and Bev for today's treats. Please do join us after worship for coffee, fellowship, and snackables. Our Lenten service this week, our midweek Lenten service, uh, will be up at St. John's Warman at 7 o'clock p.m. Pastor Knelson will be hosting his first of our midweek Lenten services, if I remember correctly. He was installed and ordained during the pandemic, so he has not had the opportunity to welcome all of you uh, to his, his parish yet for one of these. So if you have time Wednesday night, I'm sure he would appreciate that. Also, Holy Week is on the way. So Palm Sunday is on April 2nd here at Grace. Uh, we will also, we'll be observing Monday Thursday with the entire circuit at St. Paul's on Thursday, April 6th. Good Friday, we'll be back here April the 7th at 10 o'clock a.m. And then Easter Sunday here at 10 o'clock a.m. as well. So if you want to put that in your calendar for Holy Week, that would be great. The cereal program for Seller and School has started up again, so we can start bringing cereal for them. And as well, we attempt to continue to fill our food bank bin each month. Are there any other announcements this morning? If there are none, I'd ask you to please rise. Let us come before God, our Father, confessing our sins and seeking his mercy. We cry out of the beggars who sought your healing. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. We take a time of silence for reflection on God's word and for self-examination. Father, we confess to you that we have sinned against you and against our neighbors. We have not loved you with our whole heart, and we have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We have not used your name as you have commanded us to use it. We have not kept your day holy as we should. We have not honored our parents or those in authority over us. We have sinned in thought, word, and deed, by things done and things not done. We have sinned through anger, lust, and greed. We have not always spoken well of our neighbor, nor have we been content with those gifts you have already given to us. For these and for all my sins, known and unknown, I sincerely repent and seek forgiveness for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ. Have mercy on us. Give us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. 
Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all of your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Having received the forgiveness of our sins, we respond with song.
We continue with the introit for the third Sunday in Lent. Blessed are those whose strength is in you. How lovely is your dwelling place. My soul longs, yes, faints for the courts of the Lord. Even the sparrow finds a hole, and the swallow a nest for herself where she may lay her young. Blessed are those who dwell in your house. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Blessed are those whose strength is in you. You may be seated.
The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O God, whose glory it is always to have mercy, be gracious to all who have gone astray from your ways and bring them again with penitent hearts and steadfast faith to embrace and hold fast the unchangeable truth of your word. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Old Testament reading for the third Sunday in Lent is from Exodus chapter 17. All the congregation of the people of Israel moved on from the wilderness of sin by stages, according to the commandment of the Lord, and camped at Rephidim. But there was no water for the people to drink. Therefore the people quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. And Moses said to them, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water. And the people grumbled against Moses and said, Why did you bring us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? So Moses cried to the Lord, What shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said to Moses, Pass on before the people, taking with you some of the elders of Israel, and take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile, and go. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock at Horeb, and you shall strike the rock, and water shall come out of it, and the people will drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. And he called the name of the place Massah and Meribah because of the, quell- the quarreling of the people of Israel, and because they tested the Lord by saying, Is the Lord among us or not? This is the word of the Lord. We continue with our Psalm of the Day, Psalm 95. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. For the Lord is a great God, in his hand are the depths of the earth. The sea is his, for he made it. O come, let us worship and bow down, for he is our God. Today, if you hear his voice, When your followers put me to the test, the epistle is from Romans chapter 5. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. More than that, We rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. This is the word of the Lord. We rise for the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the fourth chapter. Jesus came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, so Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. There came a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink, for his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, 
if you knew the gift of God, and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw water with, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty forever. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I may not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You are right in saying, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated, and I don't see any of our children this morning, so we will continue by singing our next song. I said. 
Grace, Grace mercy, mercy, and peace be to you from God, God the Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Christ. Amen. Our, our text, text for this morning is all wrong. wrong. Everything, Everything about it is wrong. wrong. Why, Why is it all wrong? wrong? Well, well the, the woman, woman is a Samaritan. Samaritan. So, so Samaria, Samaria fell before, before Jerusalem did because the Samaritans the in the Old Testament, Testament decided to strike a deal with Egypt to keep the Assyrians out of their land. And that went about as well as you would expect in that they were conquered by the Assyrians and led into exile and all kinds of things. So there's a split in the kingdom from then on. The Samarian, Samaritans in the north, the Jews in the south, because they remained faithful for a couple centuries longer until they too fell uh, to the Babylonians. And so they've got enmity between the two. The Samaritans and the Jerusalems, the, the Jews, don't like each other. The Samaritans worship in the north. The Jews say you must worship in Jerusalem. And so there's enmity between the two. So to have Jesus and the Samaritan woman talking is wrong. And by our modern standards, our text is wrong because Jesus doesn't affirm her lifestyle and life choices, does he? You have five, had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. And he calls her to repentance. And so that's wrong then. And what's really, really odd, and we didn't get to it in our gospel reading for this morning, is that after being called out for a very specific and personal sin, the woman goes and does evangelism and brings more people to Jesus. Now that's odd, isn't it? You think in our modern context, if a pastor called you out, even if it was in a uh, private place like a well, and said, you have sinned in this way, what would most people do? Would they come back to church that Sunday? Would they go and get their friends and tell them, you got to come to this church? Not likely. And yet that's what happens in our text for today. Jesus reaches out to the woman of Samaria. He doesn't affirm her lifestyle, but instead leads her to repentance and faith because she knows that the Messiah is coming. She admits that herself near the end of our gospel reading. She says, I know the Messiah is yet to come. She is, in fact, waiting for someone to come and save the people of Samaria, as well as the people of Jerusalem. And so maybe, sometimes, when we think about our evangelism, we could see why our evangelism runs cold. Why is this woman so enthused to go tell her friends about this Christ? Because he knows something about her, and he's brought her to repentance, because she knows exactly how terrible she's been. And so she also knows then the depth of the living water that Christ is offering. This isn't some plaything that Jesus is giving her. It's not a pat on the back, right? It is a clean slate in the eyes of God. And so she goes and evangelizes because she realizes the depth of what she's been forgiven. But this is a trouble for us, isn't it? Because we don't like to dwell on our sin. We don't think of us ourselves as sinners, right? Not in context of ourselves, not in context with our relationship. But let's, let's think about this. Let's say before you came into worship today, I was able to plug into your brain and download every thought that you had this past week. And now let's say I've got the same miracle technology and I can now project all of your thoughts onto the screen. Before we begin confession and absolution, everybody's here, everybody's gathered as they are now, and now your thoughts, your words, your deeds are now projected on our screens here. How much would you enjoy that experience? Probably not a lot. But would it prove to you the depth of your own sin? It probably would. Because we tend to think lightly of our sin, don't we? I'm not so bad, that other person over there, they are a thousand times worse than me. Right? I'm the good person in all of my stories, right? I'm the person who's been victimized by everyone around me. Certainly I have done nothing to bring that upon myself. And yet if we were to project our thoughts, words, and deeds from this past week on the screen, that might suggest otherwise. If every secret thought of hatred, every secret thought of greed, every secret thought of forbidden desire was laid up on the screen to see, you would know the depth of your sin. And the reality is this. 
all of those thoughts are laid bare before the Lord God Almighty who is in heaven. When we go through our confirmation classes, we talk about God being omniscient. That is to say, God is all-knowing. So that is to say that God knows everything that would be on that screen. He knows all of it. He's seen all of it. He has seen all of your sinful deeds. Yes, he's even seen that one. And so our text is wrong in a different way. The Samaritan woman does not deserve living water. Right? She doesn't. Five husbands and now a sixth guy who's not your husband? That is no bueno. She doesn't deserve forgiveness. And by what we would put up on our screens if we had access to your brain, we would also come to that conclusion, wouldn't we? That not one of us in this building this morning would deserve the living water that is offered. Not a one of us would qualify. And so that's why Christ leads the woman to repentance. That is why Christ has brought this church to lead us to repentance. Partly to put an end to her self-destructive behavior and the behavior that destroys the community around her. The same way he calls us to put an end to our self-destructive sinful behavior, which impacts the community around us but But also also to forgive forgive her sin so that that she can can live restored to God, to be restored to her neighbor, which is why we are called here this morning as well, so that we can be called to a restored relationship with God. Not because of any of our goodness, not of our ability to draw this water, this living water that we all need, but rather because of Christ's mercy. And that is why Christ calls you here. That is why all of our Sunday services begin with repentance. They all begin with the confession of our sins because we know we're not the good people we pretend to be. All of our thoughts, words, and actions are tainted by sin. Even our good deeds are colored by pride and the desire to be seen doing good works. And And that that is why we need Jesus Jesus to draw us to repentance by his Holy Spirit. Spirit. And this is ultimately why he has to give to us living water. This text in the eyes of the world is all wrong. The Samaritan doesn't deserve it. Jesus should just let her continue living her life. And she shouldn't be going evangelizing after having her most private sin brought up by a prophet, by the prophet Christ, the Son of God. And she certainly shouldn't be evangelizing after that. But when you think about it, spiritually, it makes sense. We all go through life attempting to hide our sins and our sinful nature. This is one of the things that the world continually levels against Christians. You are such hypocrites, you Christians. And we're like, yes. We are. The Ten Commandments Commandments say this, the bar is high. They demand perfection of thought, word, and deed, and we are over here. We are hypocrites by our nature, but we are saved not by our works, but by Christ. He is the one who brings us to repentance. He is the one who gives us the gift of Faith. He is the one who, if you want to use the terminology, covers the gap, right? The gap between here and here is covered over by Christ. And this is the reality. We are hypocrites. We don't deserve Christ. But that just simply goes to show how merciful God is. We're coming up on Good Friday. We don't deserve what happens on Good Friday. We don't deserve God dying in our place. And yet yet that's that's what he does. does. Because Because we are incapable of dying for our own sin as well. And scarcely, as our text says, we're not going, or our epistle reading said, we're not going to die for another person. We might dare to die if they were a good person. We might dare to die if they were our best friend. But we're certainly not going to die for our enemies, are we? And yet that is what Christ did. He came into our text for this morning into the country of his enemies, right? The Samaritans and the Jews 
dislike each other deeply. He comes into that situation and he offers mercy. He offers mercy by calling the woman to repentance. And so you're right. You can look at this text and say she doesn't deserve God's mercy. But we should also then look in the mirror and say, well, the person in the mirror doesn't deserve God's mercy either. And we would be absolutely right. Our debt of sin is too large. And we would poison any water that we might try and make for ourselves. And since we can't live by the standard of perfection laid down in the Holy Scripture for us, our only hope is in Christ. Our only hope is in the one who brings us living water. Our only hope is in Christ who gives us living water in our baptisms. Knowing this gift, we should not hesitate to proclaim the mercy and goodness of Christ our Lord to those around us, especially because his righteousness and in his mercy is in such direct contrast to our own. And this makes the power of Christ's message even more real. Think about it this way. Your friends and family are perfectly aware of what kind of a schmuck we are all capable of being. Right? We've known each other a long time. We all know. They all know our weaknesses. They all know our foibles. They all know our sins. So if they understand that even us, warts and alls, can be forgiven, then it helps them to understand that they too, warts and all, can be forgiven and reconciled to God. Because we're not in the business of being perfect. In our church, we are in the business of being forgiven. And who deserves forgiveness? Everybody. Now, some people will reject that gift of God, absolutely. But living water is, a, is what's on tap in our churches. And who is that living water for? It's for the worst sinners imaginable. A few years ago, we did a book study here. The book title is Mission at Nuremberg, an American Army Chaplain at the Trial of the Nazis. LCMS Pastor Garricky gets the call from the Army to go to Nuremberg. Placed into his pastoral care are 15 high-ranking Nazis, including the likes of Rudolf Hess, Hermann Goering, and Keitel. It is a who's who of the Nazi regime. What is his task? To lead them to confession, to absolution, and the Lord's Supper. He has given 15 of these men to do this work for. And a few will go to their death, to the hanging, praising Christ. A few of them will go to their death, to their hanging, having received the Lord's Supper. A few of them will go to their death, having confessed their sins before God and man. True, some don't. Garing and Hess being the notable exceptions to this. But more than a few repent. So, if the Samaritan woman at the well can be called to repentance and forgiveness, if the Nazis at Nuremberg can be called to repentance and forgiveness, if you yourselves can be called to repentance and forgiveness, then that shows not our greatness and righteousness, but God's. God calls all to repentance, even those, maybe even especially those we find personally reprehensible. Do all heed the call of God? They do not. This is true even in Christ's ministry. We can think, for the example, of the rich young man. He comes to Jesus and asks, what, what must I do to be saved? Jesus tells him the hard answer, and the man does what? And goes away sad, for he had many possessions. Even Christ's own ministry is not what we would always call successful. Some walk away. Some are so bothered by this preaching that Christ gives this young man. He goes to his disciples and says, do you too want to leave as well? Because he knows this is a hard teaching. And what does Peter say? Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words 
of eternal life. And that's what Christ gives you today. The words of eternal life and living water. And you have been washed with this living water in your baptism. Your sins have all been washed away, not because you are so good, but because Christ is so perfect. And today again, he has called you to repentance and to forgiveness. Today he has given you the living water of his holy word and has washed you again of your sin. And because of this, instead of seeing a PowerPoint of all of your sins, Crod instead sees the shed blood of Christ on your behalf. God no longer sees your unrighteousness, but he sees Christ's shed blood for you. Christ himself is the living water that washes and sustains you. And that is why he has called you here today. And that is why he sustains you through the living water of holy baptism. That is why he sustains you through the living water of the absolution. That is why he sustains you through the living water given to us in the Lord's Supper, through the body and blood of our Lord. And on Good Friday, we will hear again how the living water rushes from his side when it is pierced. This is the mercy, righteousness, and perfection of God. Poured out for you. Poured out for you because of his mercy for you, because of his love for you. Christ lays down his life for you. And Christ takes his life up again for you. And for today, know this. You have Christ's mercy. He has washed you, and he has placed you in the holy ark of his church, which is carried on and sustained by his living water. Thanks be to God. And now the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord unto life everlasting. Amen. Having heard the word of our Lord and having been instructed in it, we rise and confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated as we gather our offering.
we rise, rise for, for prayer. prayer. This, this morning, morning I will say, let, let us pray to the Lord, Lord in your responses, responses Lord, Lord have mercy. mercy. Let, let us pray, pray for, for the whole people, people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. For, for the faithful proclamation of Christ's saving name, that God's people may be strengthened in the true faith and his kingdom extended, let us pray to the Lord. For the holy Christian church throughout the world, and for all who confess the name of Christ, that God would guard and defend us from the temptations of the devil, the world, and our sinful nature, let us pray to the Lord. For this congregation, its mission, and its people, for the ability to meet the needs that arise as we do the work God has given us to do, and for the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the educational institutions of our synod, for our preschools, our day schools and high schools, our colleges and universities, and for our seminaries, that those who teach and those who learn in them would be transformed by the wisdom of Christ. We pray especially for our adopted student, Martin Jagnow. Let us pray to the Lord. For all who partake this day of Christ's holy body and blood, that in their eating and drinking, they may receive the benefits of forgiveness of sins and a renewal of life and have a foretaste of the feast to come. Let us pray to the Lord. For those who have wandered from the faith, that the Holy Spirit would use us to call them home to the Father. Let us pray to the Lord. For the government and all who have been set into positions of leadership, that they may use the authority entrusted to them honorably and for the good of the people. Let us pray to the Lord. For all who serve in worthy occupations, professions, arts, and sciences, that God would grant them skill and integrity in the performance of their responsibilities and valued service through their vocations. Let us pray to the Lord. For those who suffer from hunger, homelessness, poverty, or unemployment, that God's great mercy and love would preserve and relieve them. Let us pray to the Lord. For all the faithful, that the Spirit would lead them to cheerful, generous giving from the bounty the Lord provides to support the church and to help those in need. Let us pray to the Lord. For those who are sick, especially Elvira Keller, Sean Brown, Colleen King, Don Lockhart, Judy Koval, Stacy and Colleen Anweiler, Brett Smith, Geneva, Linda Fetterspiel, Bennett Slater, Haley Townsend, Derek Stilling, Andrew Frank, Mabel Kinzel, Brock Lockhart, John Riggs, Pastor Rob Grout, Cheryl, Caleb, and Val Perseski, that God would grant healing to their bodies and strength to bear their infirmities with patience and grace. Let us pray to the Lord. For those who mourn, especially the family and friends of Ron Keller, <coughs> yet in their <coughs> that in their time of sorrow they would not lose hope, but rely on God's promise that he will never leave them or forsake them. Let us pray to the Lord. For those who rejoice in the blessings of God, that they may always remember the giver of every gift and give him heartfelt thanks. Let us pray to the Lord. O Lord, Heavenly Father, we gratefully remember the sufferings and death of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, for our salvation. Rejoicing in his victorious resurrection from the dead, we draw strength from his ascension before you, where he ever stands for us as our own high priest. Gather us together from the ends of the earth to celebrate with all the faithful the marriage feast of the Lamb in his kingdom, which has no end. And graciously receive our prayers, deliver and preserve us. For to you alone we give all glory, honor, and worship, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We continue with the service of the sacrament. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, O Lord our God, King of all creation. For you have had mercy on us and given your only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. 
Grant us your spirit, gracious Father, that we may give heed to the testament of your Son in true faith, and above all, firmly take to heart the words with which Christ gives to us his body and blood for our forgiveness. By your grace, lead us to remember and give thanks for the boundless love which he has manifested to us, when by pouring out his precious blood, he saved us from your righteous wrath and from sin, death, and hell. Grant that we may receive the bread and wine, that is, his body and blood, as a gift, guarantee, and pledge of his salvation. Graciously receive our prayers, deliver and preserve us. To you alone, O Father, be all glory, honor, and worship, with the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. In the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, at his command and with his own words, we receive his testament. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he gave him thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper. And when he gave him thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is a New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.